How do you avoid wasted time, money, and resources from short-sighted decisions? When you think in systems, you can learn to recognize the relationship between structure and behavior to create better long-term choices for your business. We read the book Thinking in Systems by author Donella H. Meadows, who created the systems thinking approach to help you understand, adjust, and improve any system. We'll share the top insights to hone your ability to build upon and benefit from reinforcing feedback loops, create and foster sustainability in your industry, and get creative to redesign flawed systems. In addition to basic and complex system fundamentals, we'll also review Meadow's insights into a number of common traps that systems create and how to escape them. Real quick, for those of you who don't know us, we analyze business frameworks and summarize business books to stay on top of the latest business strategies. Before we talk about the insights, let's talk about the author. Donella H. Meadows was an American environmentalist, scientist, educator, and writer with a PhD in biophysics from Harvard and a research fellow at MIT. At MIT, she was a member of the team that invented systems dynamics and the principles behind magnetic data storage for computers. Later on, she became a Pew Scholar in Conservation and Environment and was a MacArthur Fellow that founded the Sustainability Institute, which combined research in global systems with practical demonstration of sustainable living, including the development of co-housing on organic farms, which is also known as an eco-village. Her book, Thinking in Systems, is more or less a collection of her research and studies on systems modeling and systems thinking that offers insights on how to solve problems on a personal level all the way up to the global scale. Before we get to how systems thinking can help you improve flawed systems, let's review a few definitions of terms in the system modeling framework. Meadows defines a system as a set of independent things that are interconnected in a way that causes them to produce their own patterns over time. Nearly everything is a system, from our bodies to the universe and the computer you use to watch this video. Systems are influenced by outside factors, but any system's patterns are largely internal. For example, the market economy has natural ups and downs that can be impacted by politics, but it's not driven exclusively by them. A system consists of elements, interconnections, and functions. In the case of human-built systems, functions could also be a purpose. Stocks are the foundation of a system and are the element that you can see, feel, count, or measure. Customer satisfaction labels can be a stock, for example. Stocks change over time through the actions of flows, i.e. sales growth, shortages, features, etc. You can understand the behavior of computer systems if you observe the dynamics of stocks and flows. A bathtub is a system that consists of inflow, the faucet, and outflow, the drain, and the stock is the water in the tub. If you plug the drain or turn down the water, the stock is impacted accordingly. A feedback loop is formed when change in stock affects the flows in or out of the same stock. A prime example of this is the concept of interest as it relates to the amount of money in a bank account. Likewise, if you see less money in your account, you might react and take more work, and thus the cycle continues. Feedback loops are an important part of how systems work, and they're also a key part of being successful in business and investing. A reinforcing feedback loop enhances whatever direction or change is imposed on it. High inflation leads to higher prices, increased wages, and leads to price hikes. Reinforcing feedback loops are found whenever a stock has the capacity to reproduce itself or grow as a constant fraction of itself. If you support positive feedback loops like reinvestment of profits, this behavior can be harnessed. The more customers leave positive feedbacks about your company, the more people will try it and leave more positive feedback. Over time, your stock, in this case, customer satisfaction, will reproduce on its own. It's possible to calculate the amount of time it would take to double a stock within a reinforcing feedback loop. This doubling time equals approximately 70 divided by the growth rate in percentage. If you deposit $100 at a 7% interest, it will take you 10 years to double your initial investment. Negative reinforcing feedback loops are better known as vicious cycles. If you're stressed, you might eat a tub of ice cream, which makes you feel guilty, which stresses you out, so you reach for more food. For example, if you allow performance standards to be influenced by path performance, it sets up a reinforcing loop that lowers goals and sends your system towards low performance. To avoid this, set standards according to the best performance instead of being discouraged by the worst. 
Another reinforcing feedback loop occurs when winners are systematically awarded with the means to win again. If allowed to continue, winners take all and losers are eliminated. Combat this loop through diversification, like antitrust laws, or devise rewards for success that do not bias the next round of competition in favor of previous winners. While reinforcing feedback loops seem like they will go on indefinitely, Meadows says any physical system that grows is limited by naturally occurring rules. So what's the limit to reinforcing feedback loops? Natural systems must have at least one reinforcing loop that drives growth and another balancing loop that constrains it. Balancing feedback loops seek goals like stability and resist change. If you push a stock level too far up, a balancing loop will try and pull it back down. A cup of coffee begins hot, then cools. If temperature is your stock, a cup warmer will resist the change. These two stock systems have a renewable stock constrained by a non-renewable stock such as any industry that works with the environment like forestry, energy, or livestock. The constraints imposed on a renewable versus non-renewable system differ based on stocks and flows. Non-renewable resources are stock limited, whereas renewable resources are flow limited. If you extract a non-renewable resource faster than it can regenerate, it will essentially create a non-renewable system. Interestingly, a quantity that grows exponentially towards a constraint reaches that limit at a surprisingly short amount of time. Take this for example. If you are an oil company that has identified a new drilling site and the resource turns out to be much larger than geologists anticipated, you can increase extraction and see profits quickly but exhaust the resource faster. Alternatively, you can make less money but keep a steadier extraction for a longer period of time. With variables such as fuel demand and oil prices in constant flux, either choice is a gamble. Fisheries run into a similar problem. Overcrowding lowers reproduction rates, and rare fish that fetch a higher price reproduce less often. The balancing feedback of smaller harvests that reduce profits bring down the investment rate quickly enough to prevent the fleet of ships from growing too large that overfishing occurs. Whaling was one of the most prominent businesses in America before scientists understood the animal's long reproductive cycles. At the time, Whales appear to be an infinite resource, but prove to be quite the opposite. The input that is most important for a system is the one that's most limited, such as oil or fish in those last examples. These limits can easily be misidentified through assumptions like, we'll harvest more each year if we double our fleet of ships. These limits can be self-imposed, and if not, they'll be system-imposed, such as a finite resource that runs out completely and collapses the industry dependent on that resource. Build up your system's immune system through the maintenance of each element so that it can better maintain itself. Resilience arises through redundancy from multiple feedback loops that work together through different mechanisms and timescales to restore a system. Make sure no one feedback loop goes unsupported. Awareness of a system's resilience enables one to see many ways to preserve or enhance this quality. When a system loses its ability to be self-reliant, you may need to put regulations in place. System regulation sounds good in theory, but how do you get regulation to actually work? A regulatory feedback system accommodates variables that can be expected, but not predicted. Car dealerships, for example, consider a buffer in stock when they reorder more cars in case fulfillment is delayed or sales increase. Delays are pervasive in systems and strongly impact behavior. If you change a delay, it can greatly impact the behavior of your system for better or worse. Speed up an information delay and part of your system might work faster, but if you overcompensate a change, it can cause a reinforcing feedback loop. Any new regulation policy pulls the stock further away from the goals of individual actors. When various actors try to pull a system stock towards various goals, the result can be policy resistance. To combat this resistance, establish a sense of unity that brings all actors together and seek mutually satisfactory ways for all goals to be realized or shift everyone's focus towards a larger and more important goal that everyone can get behind. From exploits in video games to government agencies that spend useless dollars to prevent a lower budget next year, the rules that govern your system can lead to the exploitation of loopholes that distort that system. If an attitude of beat the system is pervasive with users throughout your system, Treat these rule exploits as helpful feedback. Ask if there is a better way to achieve your goal, then redesign rules to encourage creativity away from exploitation and towards the rule's intended purpose. 
follow the spirit of the law rather than the letter of the law. Beware of policies or practices that relieve systems or deny singles that fail to address the underlying problem. Think of the quote from Robert Persig, who wrote the book Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. If a revolution destroys a government, but the systemic patterns of thought that produce that government are left intact, then those patterns will repeat themselves. Meta says that when a system becomes dependent on intervention and less able to maintain its own desired state, you will need to intervene to strengthen elements of your system in a way that allows the system to better support itself. Ask, why have the natural correction mechanisms failed? How can obstacles in their success be removed? And how can mechanisms for their success be made more effective? Take the focus off of short-term relief and instead think long-term sustainability. Then remove yourself from the equation. Last, if your goals are defined inaccurately or incompletely, the system may work obediently but produce a contrary result to your original intentions. Specify your indicators and goals to not confuse effort with result. Otherwise, you'll be left with a system that produces effort, not outcomes. Remember, these dynamic system studies are not designed to predict the future. Rather, they are designed to explore what would happen if a number of driving factors unfold in a range of different ways. When you test the value of a model, ask yourself, are the driving factors likely to unfold this way? If they did, would the system react that way? And what is the force behind the driving factors? The success of this systems thinking model depends not on whether the model's driving scenarios are realistic, but on whether it responds with a realistic pattern of behavior.